heart, through the computers. Okay, here we go. So first of all, does anybody have any questions about doing implicit differentiation with respect to T? Okay, then we'll go into my little intro. Now, um, I want you to think about this uh, scenario. You have your water bottle, your, what are the common brands? I don't know, your clean canteen or whatever they're called. You have your cylindrical water bottle um, that you're going to fill up at the water bottle filling station at school and it's empty. And let's say just time is passing, right? Time is always passing, but let's say that you started a stopwatch as you're, to, as you're filling up your, uh, your canteen, your water bottle. And the water starts filling up and then your canteen or water bottle is full and you, you stop the stopwatch. What are some quantities that were changing as you were filling up the water bottle? The amount of water. Right, what's another way we could maybe describe the amount of water in the canteen? Um, the volume. The volume of the water, right? As time is passing, the volume would be increasing, right? Um, anything else, are there any other quantities that might be changing? as time is passing and you're filling up the water bottle? The weight? Uh, yeah, that's, I guess that's a good point too, right? As the volume increases, the weight would also increase. Um, what about the water starts really low, right? And then as the volume is increasing, the water level is going up in the bottle, right? So the height of the water would be increasing. Um, we could also think about the, let's think about the, uh, the diameter of the water bottle or even the radius of the water in the water bottle. As time is passing and that's filling, would that be changing? Well, at the very be at the very beginning, it like fills it up, and then as it goes on, then it stays the same. Right. So kind of. So you're also going to notice with these types of problems that we make some some assumptions um, to kind of simplify situations. And so let's assume that right when the water drops in, the bottom is completely covered, and then as time is passing the diameter of the water in the bottle would stay constant, right? It wouldn't be changing. But the volume and the water level, those would both be increasing as time is passing. So we could say that certain quantities that are changing are related. Like we could say that the water level, which is the height of the water in, in the bottle is related to the volume of water that's in the bottle. We could also say that the rates at which those values, those quantities are changing are also related. Um, another situation which when we're in person, I normally bring like, uh, bring a bag of balloons in and we all blow up balloons and talk about what different quantities are changing. So let's think about if we were blowing up a balloon, what would be changing about the balloon? Size, be expanding. Say that one more time. The balloon would get bigger. It would get bigger. So what's like a, what's a measurable quantity that we could say is getting larger? Like the volume of air 
Yeah, the volume of air would be increasing. Um, what other quantities could be changing? How about what happens to um, like the rubber of the balloon? Like as we blow air into it and the volume increases, what happens to like the actual balloon? It, it expands. It expands. So we could describe that as the surface area increasing. Uh, we could also say that the diameter or the radius of the balloon is also increasing. And those different quantities, if we're thinking about as time is passing, um, those different quantities are related to each other, but their rates at which they're changing as time is passing is also related to, to each other, okay? So related rates problems are problems that involve finding a rate at which a quantity changes by relating the quantity to other quantities whose rates of change are known. That sounds really complicated, but it's not. Basically, for related rates problems, you're given the rate at which one quantity is changing with respect to time and being asked to solve for another rate. So in the case of like the water bottle filling um, and assuming the water bottle is like a cylinder in shape, um, you might be given the rate at which the height of the water is changing and be asked um, to solve for the rate at which the volume is changing. Um, so related rates problems are you're given a rate and being asked to solve for another rate, which is related. And we're gonna be using implicit differentiation in order to determine what those rates of change are, um, which will, in our case, will always be with respect to time. So when we differentiate with respect to an independent variable, usually time, in our case, always time, we're deriving the relationship between the rates. So if we have in a, the formula for like volume of a cylinder, and that describes the relationship between volume and another quantity or multiple quantities, when we take the derivative with respect to time of that equation, we're coming up with a new equation that relates the rates of change. One other thing before we move into our first example is remember when we are differentiating with respect to x, it was kind of confusing to understand what it meant like the derivative of y with respect to x, like what, what does that mean? And it's the formula, right? When you find the derivative with respect to x, you're finding a formula that tells you how the outputs are changing, how y is changing as x is changing. Well, now we're differentiating with respect to time. So like if we wanted to find uh, the rate at which volume is changing with respect to time, we can think back to the notation that we used where we wanted to know the derivative of y with respect to x, right? Which was dy over dx. And to find the derivative or represent the derivative of um, volume with respect to time, which would tell us how volume is changing with respect to time, that could be represented as dv over dt. Or if we wanted to find the rate at which um, the radius is changing with respect to time, whether we're talking about um, the radius of just a circle or a sphere um, or a cylinder, then we could represent that as dr over dt, okay? 
Does anyone have, before I move into our first example, does anyone have any questions for me at this point? So we're gonna start with a pretty basic um, example. And it's called, in the name of the examples, which I've referenced in the agenda are at the very top of each example. So we're doing the moving particle example right now. So a particle is moving along the graph of x squared minus four y squared equals to nine. So imagine a particle moving along a graph in the xy plane. And the, this graph in particular is actually um, a sideways hyperbola, so a hyperbola that opens out. If you studied conic, remember studying conic sections last year. And when the particle is at the point five comma negative two, its x coordinate is increasing at a rate of three units per second. How fast is the y coordinate changing at that moment? Now, if we're thinking about time passing and the particle moving around the xy plane as time is passing, each ordered pair represents a moment in time or can be used to describe a moment in time, right? It describes the particle's position at a moment. So five comma negative two is really describing to us that instant, right, that we want to calculate the rate of change, the instantaneous rate of change of the y coordinate. And we're given that the x coordinate at that particular moment in time is increasing at a rate of three units per second. So in the next slide, I'm going to actually outline all of the steps for these problems that we're going to follow, but I'll, I'll still use those steps in this example. And I always like to state what the given rate is first or what the given information is. So we are given that the X coordinate is increasing. So that means as time is passing, X is getting larger. So we're given that X is increasing at a rate of three units per second. So the rate of change of X with respect to time would be dx over dt. And because the x coordinate is increasing, we say it's equal to positive three units per second. If it were decreasing, we would use negative three units per second. And then we want to find the rate at which y is changing with respect to time. So we're trying to find dy over dt when the particle is at the point five comma negative two. So that's stating what rate we know. And now we've stated the rate that we're solving for and at what, what uh, moment in time, at what instant. In this example, we are given the relationship between X and Y. Right? We're given the equation that represents their relationship. So in order to derive the relationship between their rates of change, we would just take the derivative with respect to T of that equation. So I made you guys write out the step for your test where you stated you were differentiating with respect to X. And I said that's because we're not always going to be differentiating with respect to X. And now we're differentiating with respect to T and we're going to state that. And I'm gonna pause here for a second. I just wanna see if anybody has any questions. I'm gonna join on my phone. Sure. But that's not really. Okay, so now it's time to differentiate with respect to T. So thinking chain rule, 
in order to differentiate the x squared term with respect to t. I'm thinking of the exponent of two as being the outside function, the x as being the inside function. So I bring the two down, I subtract one from the exponent, I leave the inside alone, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside with respect to t, which that's the derivative of x with respect to t, or dx over dt. Then moving on to the next term, I have that minus four, the constant pulled out, but we can multiply that by the two when we bring the two down. So it'll be minus eight, subtract one from the exponent, leave the inside alone, and then multiply by the derivative of y with respect to t. And the derivative of the constant nine will be zero. So just to clean that up, that's 2x times dx over dt minus 8y times dy over dt equals 0. Any questions? Okay, so we are trying to find dy over dt. Uh, we found the derivative, so we can actually plug in the values that we do know and then isolate dy over dt using algebra. So we know that dx over dt is equal to three and we'll be able to plug that in. We know that x is equal to 5 and negative 2, sorry, y is equal to negative 2. So we can plug, if you want to solve for dy over dt just with the variables, you can do that. Or right after you take the derivative, you are then allowed to plug values in. That are describing the moment in time that you're calculating the rate of change for. So I'm going to plug those values in. And then when I simplify, but that's going to be 30 my plus 16 times dy over dt equals zero. Uh, so if we subtract 30 and divide by 16, we'll get dy over dt equals to negative 15 eighths. And for units, I think, okay, well, y is being measured in units, right? I can kind of refer to the given rate, dx over dt, times being measured in seconds. So this is going to be units per second. And then this is a word problem. So we want to summarize with a complete sentence. So we could say something like the y coordinate is decreasing. And that describes the negative. So the y coordinate is decreasing at a rate of 15 eighth units per second when the particle is at five comma negative two. So again, the G, by stating decreasing, that the Y coordinate is decreasing as time is passing, that takes care of the negative. So you don't need to say the Y coordinate is decreasing at a rate of negative 15 units per second. 
that doesn't really make sense. We describe the negative um, using our words and then we can say at what rate it is either um, decreasing or falling or what, whatever word is appropriate for describing that. Okay, pausing, anybody have questions? Okay, so just if you need, if you do have any questions, just unmute yourself and ask, interrupt me. All right, this is my general method for solving related rates problems. Uh, so when possible, draw a picture, okay? And label the picture. Sometimes I will give you a picture um, and you'll maybe have to label, uh, but draw a picture whenever possible, it might help with just understanding um, what the relationship is between the quantities. Because you will not always be given an equation that describes the relationship. Okay, step two is going to be to state which rate you're solving for and uh, which rate you know. So the given, like I did above here, I stated the given rate and I stated the rate that we were solving for and when. And then step three, you wanna find the relationship between um, the quantities that are true for all times in the problem. Sometimes you will be given the relationship. In the above example, I gave you the, the equation that represented the relationship. Um, I'll give you some more complicated formulas that you don't necessarily have memorized. I will give you, um, but then there are other times that you might from the picture need to derive and figure out what that relationship is. And the goal is to have a complete chain between the quantity whose rate we know and the quantity whose rate we want. And what I mean by that is we need to have an equation. If we are given the rate at which volume is changing and we wanna solve for the rate at which the radius is uh, changing, then the equation that describes the relationship between those quantities needs to have both of those variables in it. And we need to have values that we can plug in for any other uh, variables. So that then when we take the derivative, we have dv over dt and we have dr over dt. Then we take the, once you have the equation, then you can take the derivative with respect to time. And then we can plug in values. You do not want to plug in values early or before you take the derivative. The only time that you can plug in a value before you take the derivative is if it's a quantity that would not be changing. So like if we think about the water uh, bottle example that I was describing before, like we could say that the radius would not be changing as time is passing um, or the diameter wouldn't be changing as time is passing. So if you were given that information and that was a variable that was in the equation, you could plug in that value. Because after you take the derivative and then you have dr over dt, um, the rate of change would be zero because that quantity wouldn't be changing. So that's the only time that you can plug in a value before you actually take the derivative. And then after you've taken the derivative, it's just solving for the rate that you are trying to solve for. So we're gonna do two more examples together. So I'm gonna be working through the melting snowball example. And like I said, we kind of make some assumptions for these problems. So we're gonna assume that this is a perfect sphere, this snowball that we're talking about. So a spherical snowball with an outer layer of ice melts so that the volume of the snowball decreases at a rate of two cubic centimeters per minute. How fast is the radius changing when the diameter of the snowball is 10 centimeters? And I give you the equation for volume of a sphere, which relates the radius as well as the volume. So let's switch colors here. 
uh, the rate that we're given is the rate at which the volume of the snowball is decreasing. So we're given dv over dt, the rate at which volume is changing with respect to time. And because the volume is decreasing as time is passing, we would say that dv over dt is equal to negative two cubic centimeters per minute. And we are trying to find how fast the radius is changing. So we're trying to find dr over dt. And that instant that we're trying to solve, so the moment in time that we're trying to solve for that rate of change is when the diameter of the snowball is equal to 10 centimeters which means that the radius would be equal to five centimeters. And the reason I'm stating that is because there's no diameter in our, our equation for volume, uh, the equation that's given. Okay, any questions up to here? We've stated the rate that we're given and the rate that we're solving for. Okay, so we are ready to differentiate now. So we're going to take the derivative of our volume equation with respect to time. And I'm pulling the 4 thirds pi outside. You could leave it in, but I'm pulling it out because that's a constant. So the left-hand side here would be dv over dt. And then thinking chain rule, well, I would multiply the 4 thirds pi by 3, which would just be 4 pi. And then that will be r to the second power and we'll multiply by the derivative of the inside, which would be dr over dt. Question? Okay, so we're ready to plug in the values that we know. So we can plug in negative two for dv over dt. We can plug in five for r, and then we'll be able to solve for dr over dt. Wait, how did you know that r is five? Uh, because we were given that we're solving for how fast the radius is changing when the diameter is 10 centimeters. So there's no diameter in our, in our equation for volume, but we know that the diameter is twice the radius or the radius is half the diameter. So that allowed me to determine um, at that particular moment in time, right, we're finding dr over dt when d is equal to 10 centimeters. Well, at that moment in time, r would be equal to five centimeters. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so just simplifying the right hand side a little bit, that would be 100 pi times dr over dt. And then if we divide by 100 pi on each side, I'm going to flip this so that I have dr over dt equals to negative 1 over 50 pi. And to determine what the units are, right, this is how the this is the value uh, that represents how the radius is changing with respect to how time is changing. So the radius is being measured in centimeters. And I know that because the volume is cubic centimeters, 
The diameter is centimeters. So the radius would be measured in centimeters. And then time is being measured in minutes. So we can say negative one over 50 pi centimeters per minute. And then to summarize, we could say the radius is, I don't wanna write the rate as negative. I wanna interpret that negative. So because our rate is negative, that means the rate, it, the radius is decreasing at a rate of one over 50 pi centimeters per minute when, uh, you could say when the radius of the snowball is equal to five centimeters, or I'm gonna use the given, so when the diameter of the snowball, oops, is 10 centimeters. And I'm going to go through one more example with you guys before I let you go. This one won't take very long. The sliding ladder problem is a very, very common. There's pretty much a sliding ladder problem in every calculus textbook that has ever been written. Um, okay, so I need you to visualize a ladder leaning against the wall and think about if you're standing at the bottom of the ladder and you're pulling the bottom of the ladder away from the bottom of the wall or pushing it in, the top of the ladder is going to either be pushed up the wall or slide down. So this particular situation says that we have a ladder that is 25, sorry, 20 feet long leaning against a building. So I'm going to draw another, I guess I could use one of the given. I'm just going to draw another. This will be my building. If you want to use one of the givens, you can. So that's the wall, that's the ground. I'm going to have a red ladder. Okay, so this is the 20 foot long ladder that's leaning against the building. And if the bottom of the ladder slides away from the building horizontally at a rate of four feet per second, how fast is the ladder sliding down the, I switched it to house for some reason, but how fast is the ladder, slide, ladder sliding down the house when the top of the ladder is eight feet from the ground? So to finish labeling this picture, and just thinking about a ladder sliding. If you're pulling the ladder away from the wall, the distance or pushing it in, the distance between the wall, the base of the wall and the bottom of the ladder is going to be changing. So, or varying. So we could name that quantity with a variable. And I'm gonna name that quantity X. You can name it whatever variable you like. I'm going to use X. And the distance from the top of the ladder to the floor will also be varying or changing as time is passing, depending on which direction you're pushing that base of the ladder in. So I'm going to call that quantity Y. What shape has been formed here, you guys? Triangle. What type of triangle? A right triangle, 90 degrees. It is a right triangle, right? We have a 90 degree angle here. It should be a 90 degree angle. And I haven't given you guys an equation to relate the quantities that we're dealing with, but 
we know the relationship between the sides of a right triangle can be described by the Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to come back to that in just a second. And I'm going to state the rate that we're given and the rate that we're solving for. So we are given that the ladder slides away from the building horizontally, the bottom of the ladder slides away from the building horizontally at a rate of four feet per second. So that would be referring to the rate at which X in my picture is changing. And if the bottom is sliding away from the wall, will X be getting larger or smaller? Larger. Larger. So we can say that DX over DT would be equal to positive four feet per second. Whereas if the bottom of the ladder were sliding in towards the wall, then we would say DX over DT would be equal to negative four feet per second. You're thinking about whether or not the quantity is increasing or decreasing as time is passing. So we're given that and we're trying to find the rate at which the ladder, the top of the ladder is sliding down the wall. So we're trying to find the rate at which Y in my picture is changing. And if you label your picture differently, you might have a different rate that you're solving for. Like if you use a different variable and that's totally fine. And we're finding dy over dt at the moment the top of the ladder is eight feet off of the ground. So when y is equal to eight feet. So now we can go back to our picture. And as I said before, I didn't give you an equation, but from this picture, we know the relationship between X and Y can be described with the Pythagorean theorem. So X squared plus Y squared equals to 20 squared or if we simplify that, that's x squared plus y squared equals to 400. So if we can do, we have our equation that relates the quantities that are changing, which are x and y. And now we're ready to derive the relationship between the rates of change. So we're gonna differentiate with respect to t. Okay, so differentiating x squared, that's going to be 2x times dx over dt, and then 2y times dy over dt equals 0. And at this point, if you want to solve for dy over dt first, you can, or you can go ahead after you've differentiated and plug in the values that you know. And I know dx over dt is equal to four. Uh, and y will be equal to eight. Oh, but I don't have the value of x. So if I want to know what the distance of the base of the ladder is to the wall at the moment that the top of the ladder is eight feet above the ground, I can just use Pythagorean theorem to solve for x when y is equal to eight. So setting that up, We would get x squared equals to um, 336. So x would be equal to the square root of 336. And I'm sure that simplifies, but I'm just going to leave it. And x is being measured in feet. 
So then once we have the value for X, we can plug that value in to our equation. So we'll have two times root 336 times four plus two times eight times dy over dt. So I'm just gonna clean that up before I isolate dy over dt. Okay, so then if I subtract eight times root 336 and divide by 16, That'll be dy over dt equals to um, negative root 336 over 2. Which, if you pop that into your calculator, is approximately negative 9.165. Y is measured in feet. Time is measured in seconds, so the units would be feet per second. So we could say the top of the ladder is sliding down the building or the wall or the house, whatever you want to say, at a rate of, you could use the exact value. So you could say root 336 over two, or you could say approximately 9.165 feet per second. When the top of the ladder is eight feet off the ground. Oh, it's one six five, huh? Here, that's confusing. I'll just put the approximation. Okay, does anybody have any questions about this example? So I'm gonna let you guys go to watch the videos on water in a tank and sand pile. Um, water in a tank is really short. I think it's like five minutes long. And then sand pile is like 15 minutes long. It's a three part question where you're using like the previous part to help you solve for a later part. So I will be here all period if you need me